CTN and the Colleges of New Jersey present Night School. Programs that help us to better understand the world in which we live. Night School is in session. Here we're going to be working on what I think is a tremendously interesting project. Not that uh, you haven't had an interesting life up to this point, but I understand that your work will be going to Korea as part of the... Yes, it uh, will be a background show as a part of an international conference uh, sponsored with Jersey City State through um, a mechanism institution called the Asian Institute uh, between ourselves and Chiang Mai University. We're here today with Dorothy Dirks Harris, art professor at Jersey City State College and former chairman of the art department for what, nine years, Dorothy? Nine years. Nine years. And you've been, we're going to get a little rain today, possibly, so we're going to try to get this interview in. Great country, but rain. Yeah, really. Uh, how long have you been at the college? 29 years. 29 years. Uh, what brought you to Jersey City State College? Well, I had finished my graduate work there. And I knew the New York area. I was a painter. And all roads lead, lead to the mar art market, which is New York City. I continued my graduate studies and married. And my husband chose to be in the area also. Where are you originally from? Georgia. Georgia. Georgia peach? Georgia rose? Or what's the... It's uh, a peach. It's yeah. a peach. That's great. Long time ago. What, uh, what type of art do you do at the college? What is your specialty? I'm a painting professor. And I have been that for all these years. Never changing or drifting? Well, adding other things. Art education, philosophies of art, drawing, of course. But the painting instruction was always there. Could you draw some uh, parallels between uh, living in Georgia or living in New Jersey uh, as an artist? Did you, did you do art in Georgia, or did, did you leave Georgia to, to do art? No, actually, I started it was identified as a student in the grade schools and did all the murals unfortunately missing a lot of math because mm -hmm. of it mm -hmm. and I had private lessons and went in high school so by the time I went to college I knew that I wanted a Bachelor of Fine Arts so it was that focused. And you basically uh, while you were going to college uh, you stayed in the city most of that time you lived in the city? Oh I went to a girls school on the Mississippi uh -huh. in the Mississippi on the Gulf Coast which was cloistered we dressed for dinner in little white gloves we had wow. house mothers terrible. And how'd you paint in the little white gloves? Well I had a free spirit even that time, and uh, uh, fortunately teachers, though, that allowed me to be experimental. And I transferred to the University of Colorado and had my first big eye-opener. The first summer I went there, Rothko taught me wow. for 10 weeks that summer. And that I grew up then in terms of my visions of re beyond region into an international look. That's fantastic. What, uh, what type of students uh, do you find at Jersey City State College as far as uh, their art goes? Uh, how do they compare with... Now, you're on the uh, board for NASR, which is the National Associations of Schools of Arts and Design. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So you get to travel around the country yes. quite a bit and see different schools and different students. And how do, the, how do our students or the students from Jersey City State College uh, rank with, with these other kids? Well, it's distinctively different and much more exciting. Why do you I've say that? Because of the mix. We serve 44% black and Hispanic, 15% non-American born persons, and the rest are white and usually lower socioeconomic. Uh, professors who come from other regions and other parts of the you know, state even, we are doing the mission of serving this conglomerate of a little United Nations. And because of that, the, the excitement of the shared cultures is invigorating. Also, being five miles from New York City, mm -hmm. We have a very exciting, do you know in the last two weeks we had a student sit in because they, not for trouble, they want more time in the labs to do more work. We should be happy for that. Really? Really? The next week one of my adjunct professors had the cops in Jersey City called on campus because he did a performance art in which he buried his head in the ground and spoke through a lecture as a performance art. <laughs> they were asked to leave, please, there was no trouble. And about three days ago Ben Jones had a drag queen in the life drawing class.
if any of my colleagues could be in on this in mm -hmm. very different kind of quiet conservative schools, they would be delighted. How do you handle all this as a, uh, well, as a, as a uh, chairman? I guess everything, uh, the faculty member can, members and students can be as wild as they want, but basically uh, the dean will come down or the vice president yes. or whoever will come down on you. How do you, yes. how do you handle this? Well, generally I found that they really are finally for academic freedom in the colleges, and I was pleased when the, when the president supported our Flagging for Freedom show, which had bomb threats, and um, we had the support. If the academic setting is not for dialogue and controversy, we have no reason to exist. Changing uh, gears for a second here, we're far from Jersey City. Uh, we, we mentioned Jersey City. We're, live, we're out here somewhere in the middle of New Jersey. Yes. Uh, what, what made you make this change in, in, in coming way out here to live? Uh, why are you here and how, how is it affecting your art? Well, all painters go through changes and vicissitudes. I had been in the city. I had lived on the perimeters of the campus for about five years. Um, I grew up in the suburbs. But my contact with nature, which gives me a sanctuary and a real, actually an isolation, is my sanity these days. The older I get, the more I need my privacy. And I go back to the world. I'm in commerce with the world as a professional, and I, in contact with students is great. But I really need the isolation for focus, and it's a natural setting. How is it affecting your art? Um, in you two see ways. A change. Yeah, I think in two ways. But it ha may have more to do with growing old. I'm not sure. The two are coming together. I find that I am more able to be highly intensely focused without a fear of losing myself. People resist the art because the focus is so intense. This is a border of a borderline between sanity and insanity. Am I going to be able to come back again? Will I return and be a normal person? I'm less frightened of that, and I find my flexibility spontaneously to slide into the work with, with a kind of a crazy focus and back out to a normal person is very easy gears now, and I think the country helped me to do that. Is there an adjustment that you had to make uh, just to have all the quietness and peace and nature around you? Not at all. If you hear the birds, you hear a plane over also. That's true. Uh, in the evening, the bullfrogs give me such a concert from, from the ponds below. Uh, but also, it generally, it's obviously, the silent screams to some people, and just they can't take it. I think that the quietness is another way to be close to solitude, and it allows the noises inside to be heard, which is great for me. That's great. I notice I'd like to take a little walk around because there's some interesting, not only property, but I notice that a lot of the faculty art uh, from the department is yes, hanging here and is part of that. your home and I'd like yes. to uh, maybe we can take a little walking tour and see some of the stuff that yes. you've integrated into your uh, living space. I have things inside but whatever we see I never have enough. But and then your studio is also down the, the road of ways there and we're gonna go over there and take a look at what you're doing so why don't we just uh, trek on over there and Great. See, see what's going on. Here's a piece here of uh, John Sanginaris, I believe. Right? Yes, yeah, I have his. two of John's, uh -huh. and I hang them on the outside of the house. They're weatherproof, uh -huh. and they're a delight to me. This was done uh, uh, probably eight to ten years ago. John is painting now. Yeah, he's a man that made a transition, which oh, is why I asked you. He's a very you fine there. artist. From, uh, from ceramics yes. to painting on ceramics exactly. to painting, so exactly. there's an interesting transition. He there. is uh, a teacher now. I don't know if I have him on the staff teaching, and he's a very committed teacher, very articulate. What do we have here? Oh. This is a graduate student of ours, Bill McAndrews, and we did a swap. I gave him a six-foot canvas. He had been to my solo in New York on 57th Street, and um, I saw the fountain. This is a working fountain? Or? It does, uh-huh, uh-huh. I don't have it hooked up with the water now. You just start it, clean the leaves out, and it's, it's a lovely spray. I love the, the water is so in contact with the rhythms of the art forms. It's kind of a mini museum here. Well, I wish. I'm going to have a walk made with a heavy tractor person that'll go through the three acres. Listen, the things that are in the galleries are not the only things that are fine. You know, we have... We have yeah, this is faculty work. Oh, yeah. Enough. That's Chuck Plosky's. Uh -huh. And I purchased that about eight years ago. It was a working uh, champagne uh, server, as you can see. Uh -huh. But I oh. love it outside, so I leave it there. It's a beautiful piece. Yeah, it's and wonderful. Well out here as Thank well. you. I like it. There's some many other pieces here, but it is starting to rain, as we said. And I think yes. instead of getting wet and looking foolish, why don't we move into the studio and see what you're doing? We can go around to the other house. Okay. Fine. Okay. 
Well, here we are in your living room, Dorothy, taking a detour from the rain. I would love to have walked around the rest of the house, but I have to stop here for a second. And uh, as I look around, I realize the, the family feeling that this house has. And it uh, uh, wants me to ask a question of you, and that is, how does a, how does a woman, especially who's an artist, have a career uh, in teaching, a job, uh, an artist, a husband, a family, how do you juggle all that and be successful? Here you are years down the road and uh, still a successful, working, uh, powerful uh, person in, in the world of art. How do you manage to do that from start to finish? Well, from the start, um, I think what kept me going working at this kind of integration was that although persons think of artists as irrational, people in the creative arts really tend to try to make sense out of nonsense. And categories of your life don't make sense. Integration makes more sense. I didn't have anyone helping me with that, but persons my age can certainly help younger women and younger persons understand that the integration is just making connections. Connections of waking and sleeping, fantasy and realism, and this all connects with art too. If you're doing something you really don't love, you know very easily if you try to connect that with your life that you've chosen the wrong thing. Mm -hmm. It would even help midlife careers mm -hmm. or whatever. But that kind of integration is just making connections. The kind of connections an artist makes in the relationship of an artwork, as a matter of fact. Was it difficult in the beginning to uh, set your priorities when there was a balance of a lot of new things uh, at once? It was because before I had a family and children, I had already taught in a university. I had a master's degree. I had exhibited in the South. So it wasn't that I was maybe going to do this, I was going to be a professional artist. But it, once you see that new young creature in your arms, in your mother, it isn't, it isn't so difficult. You know what your priorities are, mm -hmm. and they are that for a while. So mother painted in the basement after midnight, after everyone's lunch and clothes were ready for school. And you do it. It's a hard decision, but it can be done. It would have to be because a lot of people would say, well, the, the, the dealing with uh, babies and husbands is enough and uh, my career is going to have to take a back seat, but uh, you didn't make that move. You went the other direction and found the hours right. to do your painting. I did. If you, are, if you are consumed by it and you're absolutely dedicated, you can't make the decision not to. And that may be the one thing that separates us. If you cannot mm -hmm. sing, if you cannot dance, if you not paint, then probably you shouldn't. Good point. Okay, let's take, go over to the studio now, finally, and uh, take a look at what you're doing. I'm delighted. Dorothy, there's a saying that goes, those that can't teach. Obviously, it doesn't apply here because the quality and the amount of work that's present just in the studio alone is, is, is mind-blowing. Uh, talk about that. I mean, uh, It's an important thing to respond to because it's a very old and tired idea. However, as late as the early 50s, Ben Sean wrote a book. In the shape of content. And he interviewed professors of fine arts and universities, and 90% of them reported that teaching their art to young people was suicidal to their own work. Hmm. 50 years later, 40 years later, we can't respond to that at all. It's as old fashioned an idea as Courbet, the French painter, in the mid 1800s when he was rejected, students came to him, he was the hero, and they said, start a new school, start a new school, and he said, the last thing you want to do is go to school. That is such a different, different world. A recent survey, I think about four years ago, in who was exhibiting in New York City, three, I think almost three-fourths of them had MAs and MFAs who had solos. It's okay to go to school. Artists who work and produce also feel comfortable about teaching. Artists are in commerce with the world. Artists push technique as well as inner expression. And those are things, again, I talked about connections that we make. It's okay to make connections. It's okay to go to school. It's okay to be in an academic setting. Well, how do your students feel about this work? This has to be a tremendous benefit to them to watch you work, to see you work, to go to your shows. It, it proves that obviously you're a working, active artist. Right. That, how does that get integrated into the educational overview? It sets a model. And those of at Jersey City State College in the art department, there's not a person teaching studio there who isn't an exhibiting artist because we really feel that there's an obligation not to get tired, not to go to sleep, to keep moving with what you set out to do is a good model for students. Does that it's, push the students to work too? Oh, it's infectious. 
They're trying to compete with us now. As you know, some of the students are trying for shows in New York. At the same time, we're trying for that also. How, how do you respond to that? Is, is there a little bit of a, is it playful or does it get serious when the students uh, start to? It, it's very clearly de uh, demarcation between those who would dare to try that and those who have worked enough to have anything splendid to look at. And it's, it's not debatable. We have students who want to work 12, 15, 20 hours in a studio, and those are the only ones who have the realistic notion that they might try for jury shows. Anything other than that is just unrealistic. Let's talk about your work. Uh, I, I see some connections between where you live and what you do. Yes. Why don't you, why don't you tell us about this series and uh, how it got started and where it's gone to? Well, I was doing for about eight years research of antique Persian carpets. And I had some shows that in that way. Um, and driving back and forth to the country, I said, I'm never going to do horses and cows. That's not into my mind. But you can't, a visual artist cannot pass something of such glorified beauty and not start. So you stop on the road, you draw, you sketch. You have your drawings, they become watercolors, and then they become large paintings. And these became 10-foot canvases. However, I kept the same painting elements. I love a frontal accent. So whatever I'm doing has a frontal accent. Color is the first import, not form. Patternization, uh, pattern is, I, I used Indian patterns from the Navajo tribes instead of Persian patterns. So I found that the same concerns that I had in each canvas, I don't give it up. I don't relinquish my painterly concerns, but certainly an artist is affected by what's around me. So uh, your art actually has a historical angle to it as well. You mentioned Navajo, you mentioned Persia, so, uh, which is all uh, laid in history and geography. So I guess if one looks at your art, not only are they looking at art, but they're looking at a, uh, a connection, if you will, of different cultures and different histories. Yes, uh, connections anyway, certainly sometimes cultures. I'm from the Deep South, and I don't paint magnolias and fried chicken, but um, even when I painted as an abstract expressionist, my connection was painting in my connection to my teacher, Mark Rothko. So a person does not start, nothing comes from nothing. And to think that you have this sudden emergence uh, at any time in life is, is pretty much of an illusion, I think. I see some new pieces as well. In fact, there's one here to the left of me. What, what are you doing now? It, this well, is another direction yes, with some I've similar. I've left the canvas as, as an isolated form. And this, again, is historical from church work or previous works in history where cabinets contained paintings. It uh, gives me a chance to leave just the canvas and work on wood. These new works in this series are, have been the manifestation of a very important connection for me. And that was some of those old ideas we had again in the earlier part of the 50s and 60s, that a decorative artist was very different from a painter, that an illustrator was different from a painter. And I don't have those fears about what is a decorative quality, what is a painting quality, because if it's done well, it's done well. And the artist only has to be concerned with whether it's splendid to behold. Um, the outer layer of these is more of a straight edge design quality. This is more painterly. The inner canvas, which can be replaced with any number of canvases for the person who purchases this work. Uh, this happens to be called counterpoint, and as unrelated as someone may think it was, it was inspired by Mozart's variations on counterpoints. So it becomes a very complex piece, but one which is much more challenging than just the single canvas sometimes. Would you sell this as a, uh, with paintings to go with it, as a set, or would, it, would you? This one doesn't have a set, but the new ones I'm planning, they have the four seasons. Moods and feelings, surely. These are uh, custom design pieces that you're having built. Did you use any found art or found objects as well? I haven't yet. Oh, yes, I did. I did in one piece that preceded this, which led me into this. Um, a pizza cutter and a fork, because in two pieces I had a counter and a world pie, which was really the first message art I had done for years. I'm not a message art painter generally. Some of the pieces almost have a religious uh, aspect to them. Is there? Do you see that? Is that uh, conscious, or was it uh, purely by design? Well, when I was a very young person, there was a formalist writer called Clive Bell, and he wrote a book on art, and it was called Art for Art's Sake as a Philosophy. And there's a chapter in there in which he said that art must replace formal religion. 
Yeah. So I felt that way as a, since I was a very small child when I would become involved in the arts, which were, have a spiritual component to me and a very personal one. I'm here with Mary Ellen Campbell, professor of art at Jersey City State College and a colleague of Dorothy Harris's. Uh, Mary Ellen, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, your insight as to uh, what direction Dorothy has taken over the last few years as far as her art goes. Well, I see Dorothy's art being influenced by her move to the country and her love of nature and uh, the different kinds of light that you see during the day, during nature. And um, I've also made a similar move so I can appreciate um, where she's coming from in that respect. and. Uh, I've always told Dorothy that she was a foul, which means she really loves bright colors and strong brush strokes and a lot of fantasy, even though she's dealing with a natural subject. And um, her earlier paintings, as you mentioned, were very large. You have the feeling of this whole big, large field of cows. And, and I think the later ones are interesting in that you feel now that she's living there. She's looking through her windows. She's seeing a much more intimate type of a landscape and sharing um, bits and pieces with people. Uh, something that she's really selected and wants someone to see more like they're looking through the window of her studio or the window of her home um, and seeing what's around her at a certain time of day and, and obviously she likes to build things and and that's uh, a very nice thing to make objects that way the painting has now become more of just a, a wall painting also an object Hi, Dorothy, and congratulations Hi. Thank on you very much. your gallery opening here. It's been a few months since we were together out at your studio, uh, and we see here the fruits of all of the work that you've done when we were out visiting you. The question that I have, the first question that I have for you is, uh, how do you handle people looking at your work? It's one thing being in a studio and working, but now it's out for the public to see. Do you have anxiety about that, or do you enjoy it, or how do you handle it? Well, once I resolve a piece, if I can stand behind it, then the anxiety is gone. The excitement starts because every person who comes and views it gives the painting a new life. I'm committed to the idea that it's a cooperative encounter, that there's not something there just to be seen by everyone, but the person brings something and the painting gives something. So actually your work isn't finished until it reaches this point. Yes, I would say that. What's been the most popular piece here tonight? Strangely enough, the small white circle that's here. Uh, very few people chose one, but about five people mentioned that one particularly, which is more traditionally painterly. It doesn't have any relief. It's not a cabinet that opens, and it's purely decorative. Uh, it's not message art. It's not figurative art. So in a way, it surprised me a lot. Isn't that one of the earlier pieces in the show here? Yes. As a matter of fact, it's a continuation of uh, the carpet paintings that I had studied from Persian uh, works. Now, I know when we were back at the studio, you were really excited about those pieces that opened, and we've spent some time on them, and the viewers now are even familiar with those pieces. Uh, do you go back now and uh, rework based on what people's opinion is? Do you try to incorporate? Of the works themselves? Yeah. Oh, ne oh no, never. Uh, the, um, the wonderful thing about being very focused and having um, a lot of research, a lot of drawings, a lot of paintings, is that uh, it's not that you need to redo or need to think of things to do. You can't do all the ideas that are in your head if you really are a working artist. So I can't wait for the weekend because I'm finishing new things now. Nothing comes from nothing. So the drawings, and I see it as a continu continuation. So someone will say, this series is done. This series came from the connectedness of the things I did two years ago 
and already these are leading to the next works. So it's a continuous process. Yes, in fact, it's a journey that doesn't have a destination like you take the subway. Uh, aesthetics and the love of beauty is like the work of the studio and the artist. You are taking a journey, the destination is never fixed, and there's an open-ended ticket. Is there any, any uh, work that takes you into a direction, or how do you decide where you're going? The, the direction that just seems to mostly engage you at the time. For instance, I had never done sculpture or relief, and one piece on a board led me to another piece that was more three-dimensional, and then the cabinets were a natural form, and I loved the wood so much, the sculpture pieces evolved. What would you consider your philosophy of art to be? Ooh, an easy one. Um, I can speak as just a production, production artist rather than a philosopher. Um, people wonder very often what the responsibility the artist has to society or to people. And I think I've really only identified one that I would be committed to, and that is not to bore the world, uh, not to produce cliches, uh, not to be cute to be cute sake, because there's an awful lot in tradition that we can, and nothing comes from nothing. Uh, so I would say if the perceiving mind is interpreting and being personal and focus. See, I fell in love with visual things when I was about three. So that it was easy. It wasn't a question of what are you going to do. I love music too. I think we talked about that. But the thing that turns me on are my eyes and the visions of the world. So in doing that with just a thrilling kind of occupation, uh, I'm committed to not being dull. We understand in today's world, you need more than what your parents needed when they came to America. You need knowledge and skills and the opportunity to try out what you've learned in business and industry. In the same tradition as Lady Liberty, Jersey City State stands for opportunity. We're the co-op school. We give you college together with on-the-job experience. We give you the power to change your tomorrow. Cooperative education at Jersey City State College. It works. Call 1-800-624-1046. Night school is dismissed.